I am excited to preach part two of Amazing Grace. Last week we talked about Amazing Grace part one. And we talked about the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace is the unearned, undeserving favor and spiritual blessing of God that resembles a gift freely given. It is a gift from God found in Jesus, the Son of God, who brought heaven, or I should say, who brought grace and truth, according to John chapter 1, into this world as reflected and represented in heaven itself through God the Father. Its sound is sweet to the ears of the one who has received it in faith. Its saving power is able to save the worst and wretched of us all. Its amazingness finds the lost, unrighteous and sick to be found and placed in Christ Jesus by His gracious finished work on the cross through faith. Its amazingness gives sight to the blind and guides them through life's happenstances, trials and tribulations, weaknesses, failings, pain, and deserving of hell itself. And yet God's amazing grace meets you right there in that spot. Amazing grace is the recognition and the placing of faith in all that Christ has done and finished on the cross for you and for me which has been imputed to the one caught in the grips of sin, treachery, condemnation, judgment, pain, and agony. For amazing grace can only be amazing when we recognize how amazingly disgraceful we were, and some of us even are. It is then and only then that the grace of Jesus himself permeates our soul unto true repentance and salvation as our faith responds to the sound of amazing grace of Jesus the Christ. If Jesus was the one, according to John chapter 1, to bring in and present to the world grace and truth, that means that every time we see the word grace and as it's explained through the word of God, especially the letters of Paul, it is an indication for us to look back at Jesus, the one who is grace, the one who is truth. The Bible says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, speaking of Jesus Christ. And so grace itself is found in Jesus himself and is manifested in the very life to which he showed us as being 100% man and 100% God. When we study the precious gospels of Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what we see is grace living and walking and breathing and with a heartbeat, with a voice, and an individual that is not scared to meet sinners right where they're at, including, including prostitutes and Tax collectors and 
different kind of individuals, lepers and those that were outcasted. Jesus Christ, never mind, the man of grace who brought grace in, the one who is grace. Never mind to step into someone's house and say, I'm spending a night. And that's a wicked man. Yeah, I know. And my grace is sufficient to find this individual in his wickedness and take him to a place that he thought he never can make it or earn or, or even deserve in that sense. We're talking about God's amazing grace found in Jesus Christ. But this song written in 1977 by, by our brother that we, we talked about, Newton, last, or last week, Every time he thought about this song and he began to sing it, it was a reminder of the pain that he went through as he was growing up when he got saved on a ship to which he almost died on and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. But from there, God began to work with him and grace began to do a mighty thing in his life. It was not until years later that he really dedicated his life to Jesus Christ and repented for being a slave trader and owner of slaves themselves. It would be slaves who would then adopt the song of amazing grace as they were going through the pains of being chained and locked down and sold as, as some kind of meat on the market. It was in those times that they began to sing the same song he sang and wrote. Oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. They began to sing this song because they thought about the essence of the man named Jesus Christ who would one day return and take us into heaven. They sang this song and as a reminder that no matter what they're going through, no matter what they did, grace is able to meet them in that very position or that very pit to which grace found them in. Whether it be the bottom of a ship from slave traders taking them from Africa to America or, or whatever the destination was, Britain or whatever the destination was, grace would find them in that place. And it would be grace that would say, I was once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. The second part of the song, as you guys see on the, on the board, is the second verse, if you will, of the song Amazing Grace. The first part of the song Amazing Grace is a part that is sung to position the singer and hear it to the essence and reality of God's amazing grace. The moment we sing amazing grace after this sermon series, we should be able that the moment grace comes up and you hear amazing grace or grace itself, that it should take us to the very face of Jesus Christ, the one who is grace. No matter where you're at, no matter what position you're in, grace always meets us there. The first part of the song of Amazing Grace explains the initial reaction of God's amazing grace in the life of the one who had put their faith in Jesus. Amazing grace found us in our particular situations. It found me in a jail cell fighting a heinous crime to which I thought I was undeserving, unearned. Even to the point that when God spoke to me in that jail cell, 1999, the summer of 1999, that I thought he was there to kill me. Because I didn't understand amazing grace. But it was amazing grace that would find me in that cell and position me in Christ in the heavenly places, even while I was still incarcerated. And so wherever this amazing grace found you in your particular situations or geographical locations and state of emergencies and showed us the face and heart of God himself, when you go back and look where God found you and where God saved you and you meditate upon it, for many of us it brings immediate tears to our eyes because we think about how insignificant we were. We think about how disgraceful we were. We think about the very depths to which the grace found us in, the very gutter of the streets of Chicago or wherever you were at when grace found you. It reminds us of Jesus and His grace to look beyond our sins and iniquities and to save a wretched man and woman like us. From hearing and receiving God's grace, it led to the salvation of our wretched lives 
and lost state apart from Jesus to which He, the one who is grace, Jesus the Christ, allowed us to be found in Him. We were blind. Walking through a fallen world, heading to destruction due to sin and separation from God. But now, we are able to see as we walk by faith and not by sight in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. But grace does not stop there and cannot stop there. You see, if you only allow grace to take you that far, you would fail as you begin to go on a journey without Jesus Christ and without even realizing it. Because if you don't take grace beyond that point, you only have a superficial salvation that doesn't take you to the end like only grace can. And some of us sing the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And if you only stop at the fact of God giving you His grace and finding you at a treacherous place, a place of no return, a place that you only can look up and find grace, Jesus, uh, putting His hand out and saying, let me do unto you through my grace to which is sufficient in your life. If you only stop there, you will never know the fullness of where grace can take you. And so we have to understand that grace cannot just stop at the fact of finding you, finding you in, and, and you're no longer lost and giving you sight that so that you're no longer blind. But where does it go from there? It can't stop there. For many of us, it stops right there. And we wonder, where is such and such? What happened to our brother in Christ? What happened to the sister in Christ? Man, they were walking and it seemed like they were walking with God. They were so happy about their salvation. They were so ecstatic and joyous. They were a rocket ship going to Pluto. They were heading to a certain direction. And then after that, they just stopped. They just gave up. What happened? What would happen was that they stopped operating and allowing grace to do what grace can only do. We're talking about amazing grace tonight. How sweet the sound of it. That saved the wretch like you and me. The one that found us. And the one that gave us sight. But the one that does not stop. There. And so we have to understand that God's grace is not just for salvation. I want to say that again. God's grace is not just for salvation. It is not just to find the lost and undeserving. It is not just to heal us from our blindness and give us eyes to see. This only explains God's grace in regards to what God's grace has done for us. But God's grace also helps us to do unto God. You see, without the second part of God's grace taking, to, taking you to a place to which we now do unto God, we only find ourselves as consumers that only take from God rather than give back. See, it is grace that would allow you to receive the grace of God for forgiveness of sins and to salvation. But it is also that grace that takes you to the other side of it that says, God, what do you want me to do for you? You see, many people stop at the first light, but they forget that grace takes them to a place where we begin to do things unto God. It teaches us. And so the song Amazing Grace continues as the words on the screen says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed." Right there lets us know that a grace, there's a grace that saves us in the first section, but there's a grace that teaches us how to do unto God. In which he has already done unto us. And so I want to be able to dissect this second part or the second verse of amazing grace scripturally to see what does this grace supposed to teach us? What was this brother talking about as he was writing this song of, or this hymn as a pastor to a congregation and singing it aloud? Can we grasp and capture the heart of this song that has been reserved for centuries? What is God trying to tell us about amazing grace? And so the first part, it was grace 
that taught my heart to fear. And so Romans 5, 6 says this. You see, at just the right time, when we were still what? Powerless. Let's try that again. When we were still what? Powerless. Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely would anyone uh, dare for a righteous person. I'm sorry, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were what? Yet sinners. Christ did what for us? He died for us. There's an essence there of amazing grace that Paul is trying to get us to see. It is a grace that takes us not just from realizing that God has given unto us his own son who brought in grace and truth that takes us from a state of lostness and and lack of being saved and unable to save ourselves to a state of being now saved and placed in Jesus Christ that now he lets us know this part of amazing grace that begins to do something in us that is then transferred back to God as a response of his grace. And the thing we see here is that God, God's grace teaches us humility. You see, when we see the verses for what they are, that God saved us while we were yet powerless, and God saved us while we were yet still sinners, we see the fact that we recognize that in God's grace, when he found me, I was, in, I was powerless to do anything for my life to be saved. I was yet still a sinner, but Jesus... He still died. And he showed me something about grace that, wanted, that wants to teach my heart to fear God himself. Yeah. You see, we can stay at the first, the, the first encounter with amazing grace, but that grace wants to take us to a place to which that same grace teaches us the very things about God. Yeah. It teaches our heart to fear God. And so grace teaches us humility in that there was nothing that we could have done to save ourselves. We were powerless sinners without wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Amazing grace, hear this, amazing grace finds us where we are in a prison cell, on our deathbed, in our condemnation and punishment and even self-mutilation. Thoughts of suicide. Amazing grace finds us in that place. But there's something about Jesus that when he finds us in his amazing grace, that he's willing not to leave us in that same state. You see, amazing grace will find you where you are, but it will never leave you as you were. It will find you as you are in that state, and then it will take you to a place to which transformation begins to happen in and through your life. That is amazing grace. And it's very specific in this song to which God is trying to speak to our hearts about that the same grace will come into our hearts and it will begin to teach my heart to fear. To fear what? Or for that matter, to fear who? Look what Proverbs 9.10 says in the Amplified Version. The reverent fear of the Lord that is worshiping Him and regarding Him as truly what? Awesome. Amazing. None like any other is the beginning and the preeminent part of wisdom. It's starting points and it's how is it in its essence. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding and spiritual insight. Oh, there's something about fearing God when the amazing grace comes into your life and takes you from salvation to actually works in that sense where faith and works combine together to produce the very image of God to which he's transforming you to be by his amazing grace. Some of us, we can't even see Jesus inside of us because we never step from this point to this point where we allow amazing grace to transform our hearts to fear God reverential fear it's a reverential fear it's a starting point and its essence is for us to fear God why is that why would amazing grace come into our hearts and teach our hearts to fear God 
Because it's a reminder that when God saved us in this state right here and found us where we were geographically, positionally, and the mindset to which we were in, that that same grace would take us to another place that would teach us that up to that point, I was relying upon my own wisdom, my own knowledge, my own understanding to live a life that was only being led by destruction and sin itself, to now leaning in the fear of God. Because grace has captivated my heart to such a degree that it now teaching me how to fear God. How do I fear God? By submitting to His wisdom. What is wisdom? It is the act of applying the knowledge of God to our lives. Look at what the verse says right here. It's a reverential fear of the Lord. That is worshiping Him. What is worship? Where the word worship comes from? It comes from the word worth. To give one worth. He is worthy of me fearing Him and submitting to Him and humbling myself that I acknowledge His wisdom and His knowledge and understanding and apply it to my life. He says the beginning of the preeminent part of wisdom, its starting point and its essence and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding and spiritual insight is recognizing as we get to know God and His amazing grace that we see how amazing Jesus Christ is, that we get to know Him and we understand Him and because we fear Him that, that according to how grace is teaching us to fear Him, that we submit to His wisdom as we deny our own wisdom. You see, it is a reminder for grace to teach our hearts to fear God so that we won't go back to the point to which He taken us from. He might have found me in a prison cell. Oh, but He set me free and put me in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. He might have found you in a prison cell in your mind and in a prison cell of your emotions and a prison cell of your circumstances and a product of your environment and culture and society. And He says, listen, I love you so much and my grace is so sufficient and my grace is so amazing that I'm not only going to find you in this place, but I'm going to take you to places that reflect heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Would you allow me to do that? But the only way that we can get to that point is that we have to get to a place where grace is no longer give me, give me, give me, and I'm going to respond whatever way, whatever way I want to do. No, now it's like, God, I receive your grace, and now will you allow your grace to teach me of my heart to fear God himself? See, some of us need to go back to the heart of worship. And I'm not, I'm not talking about praise and singing songs and things like that, but the heart of worship that teaches us how to fear God. That's what we're missing in the church. We're missing that in our society. People don't know how to fear God anymore because the church has stopped fearing God because they're now relying upon their own wisdom and their own knowledge and their own understanding. Yeah. We don't know who's who anymore. We don't know where is grace because grace just looks like a credit card that I can swipe anytime I want to and just charge my card and say, well, grace it. Grace it here and grace it there and consume it here and buy this here and do this here and whenever I want to indulge in my flesh, I'm going to do this here and whenever I want to do whatever I want to do contrary to the word of God, I'll just add a little grace card there. God understands and God is like, no, that's not grace. Yeah. And it's definitely not amazing grace. Yeah. It is only consumerism to which we're showing the world and we're showing the world just how to use a credit card in the spiritual realm. And it's using God's grace to which is not grace at all. But when we honor God and see what grace, amazing grace truly is, we're able to allow that grace to save our lives but not stay there. As we said, it will take us to a place where grace starts to teach me and to teach you how to fear God. And it all starts by first recognizing that we are powerless. We were sinners, can do nothing about our status, but Jesus, oh, the man of grace. He came with amazing grace. And now that amazing grace wants to teach us how to respond to God and now do unto God as he has done unto us. And that's fearing him. The next thing that the song talked about was, and my, my, uh, my towel is inside the... Uh, my suitcase. The next thing he talks about is, and my grace, I'm sorry, in grace, my fears relieve. Here's that word, that word again, fear. Brother Newton used it twice in this song. But this fear is not like the first fear. This fear has to do with emotions. Fear. An unpleasant, well, I'm going to read over here, an unpleasant 
often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. It's that fear. The definition of relieved. To fear, I'm sorry, to free from a burden, give aid, or help in. Sometimes we assume that God's grace is only available when we accidentally messed up. When we were ignorant of our actions and only for the BC days, meaning before Christ days of our lives. But what about while being a Christian? Like Newton was. When he got saved on that ship, he didn't immediately repent. He was still a slave trader. He still went home and seen slaves get beaten and mistreated. He still was operating a ship and even some people say he was a captain of a ship. He was still going back and forth and, and, and slave trading human beings, Africans, back and forth. And I could just see him looking back and, and just thinking back. And it's like, man, God, is, is your grace still sufficient even now? Yeah. Where I profess to be a Christian and got saved on that ship. But then I continue to go forward. And your grace continue to teach me about being, you know, seeing and not being blind anymore. Being found rather than being lost. But God, I did some things along the way. Is your grace still sufficient? It is still able. It is at that time where many of us answer the question and we say no. Grace is no longer sufficient. And so now I must depend upon myself and do it my own way. I have to find a different way outside of grace. And we start going back to works. The very works that had us separated from God anyways. The very works that could never bring us close to God, let alone bring us to a point of deserving God's grace. If anything, it causes us for us to be resisted by God and His grace because He resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so what is being proud? That God resists us. It's very simple. It's attempting to do works to gain God's grace that can only be given freely. Recognizing that you are an unearned, undeserved individual. And so therefore can never work for it. That is why God resists the proud and he calls them proud. Because they're resisting his very amazing grace. It is the same grace that found me in that jail cell. And it's the same grace that finds me today and still does what it is meant to do. And that is teach me to fear the Lord and remove the fears from my heart. And so what happens? Look at Romans 8.1, Amplified Version. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. There is no what? No guilty verdict. Some of us need to say that out loud because you think it's not true. Some of us sinned so horribly this week that you're wondering, can God possibly forgive me? Is His grace still sufficient? It may not be sufficient for me no more. Because I'm willingly silly now. I'm dealing with some addictions and I'm going through some things. Is God's grace still sufficient? Let us read this out loud. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation. It is what? No guilty verdict. No punishment. Let's say that one more time out loud. No guilty verdict, no punishment for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you see who it's only for? It is only for those who are in Christ Jesus. So then we must ask, who is Christ Jesus? What did he bring? What did he offer to the table? We go back to John chapter 1. It says Jesus Christ brought grace and truth. So it's saying only for those who are in God's grace. God's amazing grace that is found in Jesus Christ. There is no condemnation, no guilty verdict, no punishment for those who are in and found in God's grace. Some of us are missing that. You see, we feel condemnation and punishment. And instead of going and receiving the amazing grace that would remove that fear, that emotional aspect of our lives that are literally bottling up and putting us in a cage and then putting Jesus Christ as our cellmate and limiting his grace to find us in such a place again and save our lives as though his grace is not sufficient to do it again. And so what happens in that state? It begins to lock us down. And now we say, I am afraid. I am condemned. And I feel like God is going to punish me. And God is like, what are you talking about? Was not my grace sufficient when you were never my child? Was my grace not sufficient when you were powerless to save yourself? Was my grace not sufficient when it saved you even yet while you were still a sinner? Yeah. 
And then Jesus saying, how much more will my grace be sufficient now that you are in Christ Jesus and my grace? And grace, my fears, relieved. God's grace frees us from the fear of punishment, which is anticipated due to our wrongdoings. But God's grace frees us of the burden of sin, condemnation, and punishment. Just like God's grace found us powerless and unable to save ourselves, it is God's grace that also finds us in that place of condemnation when and after we have sinned. I'm going to say that when we failed God, and we're weak in that state, and we're wondering, because fear has gripped us, does God like me anymore? Is He for me or is He against me? Is God's grace there for me? I know it was there BC days, but now I'm messing up as a Christian. Is God's grace still sufficient? God said yes. Yes. We must understand that when God saved our lives, we were instantly sanctified. But the thing that was missing is a thing called transformation. You see, sanctification comes instantly, you're saved by God's grace. But transformation comes in due time. It is a process, quote-unquote, until we meet Jesus face-to-face and He removes the sinful nature. But until then, there's a transformingness that goes on in our lives. And so that is the sinful nature to which we deal with and that we must kill. That's why people say it's not a matter of if you sin, it's a matter of when you sin. And so the question then is, what happens when you sin? Is God's grace sufficient? Absolutely. But what about the credit card? Well, let's let you know what is truly a man of God. What the Bible says here. Romans 8, 28. Very familiar verse for all of us. Some of us use it out of context. We'll pray for you after this. But this is what the Bible says. And we know with great confidence. You see that part right there? With great confidence. The question is, do you have great confidence? Confidence, not in yourself, not because you look cool, not because you got a good haircut, not because you have hair and I don't, no, not because you have a beard or not a beard. With a, no, great confidence in Jesus that God, who is deeply concerned about us, what is He concerned about? How is how, how is it? Is it just a little bit? No, it's deeply concerned about us. Causes how many things to work together? All things. What is included in all things? Everything. Everything. All things mean everything. Therefore, all things has to mean even the evil and the sin to which you fell even yesterday. And some of you guys, even today. And God is saying, listen, I deeply care about you. I am deeply passionate about you. I am deeply in your life. And my grace is always sufficient. It is amazing. If you just give me a shot to show you how amazing it is that I would even work out your evil to the good of your very life. Only a God of grace can do such a thing. Only a God of grace can say, man, you're committing evil, but you know what? I forgive you in grace. And not only that, but I'm going to work out that which was evil to your good. That is amazing grace. And so he goes on. So some of you guys think that, man, pastor saying I can sin, I can just do it and God's grace is going to meet me. No, that's not real grace. Look what the Bible continues to say after it says, I cause all things to work together as a what? As a plan. Whose plan? God's plan. A plan for good for those who what God? Love God. To those who are called according to whose plan? His plan and purpose. Why did Paul have the need to go this far and explain Romans 8.28? Because he's explaining the fact that if you think you're going to take advantage of God's grace, then you better ask yourself, do you really love God? You see, only those who really love God will keep God's commandments. God said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. What is he saying? If you love me, you will not take advantage of my grace. You will embrace my grace and and allow my grace to take you to a place that will follow not your plan, but my plan and my purposes. God is trying to speak to us today and deliver some of us from condemnation and judgment and we're missing this. Meditate on what God is trying to tell us here. Listen, it is God's grace that teaches us to love God, follow His plan, and pursue His purposes. You see, that kind of love for God doesn't want to take advantage of grace. Oh yes, you're still going to fall. Oh yes, you're still going to make some mistakes. Oh yes, you're still going to fail. 
But God's grace is there to meet you at that place. But it's not there for you to take advantage of it. Because a one who truly loves God is according to God's plan and his purposes doesn't want to take, care, take advantage of that grace. So what is happening here? How does grace, my fears, relieved? Look what the Bible says in 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears has not been perfected or made perfect in his love. It's God's grace that teaches us to love God, follow His plan, and pursue His purposes. We have to understand that in this scripture, the love of God that removes the fear comes from the very amazing grace of God that even allows us to see that love for what it is. You see, it is grace that recognizes that I was powerless and sinful to even save myself. And that grace then transfers us and takes us to a place of God's love. That I love you so much that I sent my son to die for you. And not only that, but I love you so much that I'm not trying to punish you or send you to hell. You're my child now. What I'm trying to do is get my love as seen by his, by his grace, by amazing grace, to cast out the fear that you think I'm anybody other than God himself, full of grace and mercy and truth. And so it is that very grace and that very love that helps us to stay on track with Romans 8.28 that we are called according to His plan and His purpose. The moment that we don't allow grace to remove our fears of punishment and danger and all these other things that come from the emotional, sorry, the, the emotional dilemma within our lives of the flesh, we will begin to go back to default and start relying upon our own wisdom our own knowledge and our own understanding. Not only that, instead of following His plan and His purpose, guess what fear begins to do because we don't allow grace to do what it's called to do. We start following our own plan. We start going back and creating our own purposes. When God says things like, come out from amongst them. Don't marry that dude. Don't marry that chick. Don't do X, Y, and Z. Come out from that. Because we have walked away from grace and now allow fear to do whatever it wants to do, we start creating our own plan and our own purposes. And guess what? It goes against this. People are doing that right now because we're in a pandemic. People are saying, listen, I, I know God's word. I know God's grace. I know it all. I know his plan. But I also have a plan. I also have a purpose. Now, which one will you follow? You see, if you're really a child of God, you will follow this plan. I want to talk about that just for a second. Listen to this. When this word was going out, there was so much persecution in the land. Christians were being, head, being beheaded. Not only that, they were grabbing that head in Rome, putting picks in the ground and putting their heads Christians on the picks to which it created a somewhat of offense that when other Christians see it, they see the brothers and sisters in Christ's head on a stake outside, almost like in a, in a role of, of offense. There was persecution that was way worse than COVID-19. There was men and women of God dying in the masses, heads being cut off, children being raped, and then killed after that during these times. Did you think for a second they said, well, God, it's time to make another plan and be about my own purpose. Because your plan and purposes are only leading to people being beheaded and on a stake. No. They kept pressing in. They kept obeying God. There was a little, man, God, I can't, I can't go to church. Man, God, I can't do God's will. Man, God, I, I, I'll holler at you next time, God. When everything calms down, when people stop dying and being persecuted and martyred. Do you think the Christians in Africa right now, do you think they're stopping to go to church? They don't even have that in the news, man. But there is a mass murder. There's a genocide going on in Africa right now. Why do you think they continue to kill Christians? Because they keep going to church. Why do you think they keep getting blown up? Because they're still going to church. Hey, man, we just lost, man, half our congregation yesterday, man, to murder and everything else by these Muslims. Should we go to church? Well, absolutely. What does the Bible say? Don't forsake the assembly of coming together. God, if today is a day that I get blown up for Jesus, Lord, let your will be done. That's what David said. That's what the people of God had said, even in this time. 
They try to get Paul to stop going to, to go uh, spread the gospel, right? And they said, man, the Holy Spirit said, whoever's belt this is, is going to die if they go across there. Paul's like, that's my belt. He said, well, don't go over there. Listen, I'm going to go over there and preach the gospel, but they're going to kill you. I am ready to die. Just give me a hug, shake my hand, give me a holy kiss, and send me on my way. Give me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or something for the road, but I'm going over there whether I lose my life or not because I'm following the one who is above life and death, Jesus Christ. It is that kind of grace that will take us to a place that we would recognize how precious that grace is. It is a grace worth dying for. It is a grace worth laying down our life and saying, God, who am I to, to, to remove or avoid death when you yourself embraced it joyfully yeah. in your grace for a people who spit and mock at you? He is grace and truth. And his life exemplified it, exemplified it even to the point where he's on the cross, as we talked about last week, and yet and still for the same people he's dying for. He says, God, would you forgive these dudes too? They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. That is grace in the making. And so the next part of this is how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. It's our closing section of this song which is beautiful we're talking about God's grace teaching us some things and look at what it teaches us here when his grace precious grace that appeared the hour I first believed Romans 5 9 since we have now been justified by his blood how much more shall we be saved think about this how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him if we were enemies of God and now we are children of God. How much more shall God even save us now? He saved us while we were not, while we was his enemies, while we were, we were still sinners. How much more will God's grace come through even now that we're his children? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled, meaning to bring back to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is boasting in God's grace through whom we have now received reconciliation. God's amazing grace is so precious in that it appeared while we were God's enemy. We were reconciled or to restore friendship or harmony to God through the death of his son. God's grace teaches us how to treat our enemies in like manner of how he had and has treated us in accordance with his grace. Grace is trying to treat or teach us how to treat others. You see, a lot of us are held even now by the chain of what somebody else did to us. We're held by the hurts and pains of our enemies of our slanderers, of our mockers, some of us, even our parents, our friends, those we considered brothers and sisters in Christ, were held by that chain. But yet God in His grace is trying to teach us and remind us of how He treated us when we hurt Him. When we vowed Him and committed adultery and idolatry against God himself, the creator of heaven and earth, when we continually turn back to our vomit and back to our old life and he continually saves us and brings us back and we pay, play uh, tug of war with God himself and yet he's still willing to tug on our hearts and say, I still love you. My grace is still sufficient, son. Would you come back? I'm waiting for you. I'm here. And yet we go out and we treat others opposite of what grace treated us. The death of Jesus in grace, listen to this, teaches us how to live by his grace and how to treat others. The hour I first believe is a reminder that God's grace met us at the moment we believed. And God's amazing grace should meet others through us and the grace. God's amazing grace should meet others through us the moment they have sinned or hurt us. You see, the reason why we are hell bent and held on to this chain of the hurts of everybody around us. Because it is in these times 
where Jesus is trying to teach us even now in the society to which we live in racism and hate and bigotry and all these other things are on the rise a false love, a false grace and a false forgiveness and a false culture against God is met with judgment rejection ostracizing instead of grace of Jesus Christ so they too can be saved and so we have to understand that when we recognize how precious the grace of God was and is in our lives, He will teach us to share and express that same precious grace with others. Many of us are bound by the hurts and pain caused by others that limits us from the precious grace that was given and shown to us despite all the ways we have hurt God. Has anybody hurt God in this place? If I take a census, I'm pretty sure some of y'all hurt God today. Whether it be at work, when you resembled God in the wrong way, when your manager crossed you the wrong way, by the words you said on traffic, when somebody cut you off or put the brakes on you and you, you son of a biscuit, or whatever y'all said, the other word, right? You stupid, you know, gave him the bird or whatever the case may be, and we're like, ugh. And God is looking at you like, son, that definitely does not reflect my grace. What happened? Talk to me. God, I can't talk to you right now. I'm in disgrace right now. Everything about me is just this opposite of you. And then we changed the music from worship because as we were worshiping God, we actually did these things. You guys know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all don't want to talk about that kind of stuff. Y'all listening to 90.1, Moody Bible College Station, whatever y'all listening to, in the middle of worshiping, y'all cursing. and <laughs> We'll talk about that next week. Instead, we must allow the amazing grace of God and how precious His grace appeared in our lives in place of our sin and rebellion to appear in the lives of others who have hurt and sinned against us or are found in similar states as when God's grace has found us. God is putting people in our lives even today that went through the same thing we went through. And we see them for what they are because we see those things in us still. And instead of going down to their level and meeting them with grace, we walk away and say, well, God, I hope you saved that guy. And God is like, I was trying to, but you walked away. Amen. Grace teaches us to meet people exactly where grace met us. If we all can stand. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. If we all can bow our heads and close our eyes. Tonight, would you begin to allow the amazing grace of God to not just do for us, but to teach us to do for God and others by and in His grace, unearned, undeserved favor and spiritual blessing. Would you allow God's grace to humble you and teach your heart to fear God? Would you allow the amazing grace of God, your fear be relieved, to free you from the burden and give you aid or to help you even now in the status and position that you are in? If you're dealing with sin and whatever it is you're dealing with, would you let God meet you right now in that place? He's not afraid. Would you allow the precious grace of God to appear in your life as you put your faith in Jesus and allow that same grace to appear through us towards others who have hurt and sinned against us or at least and also be ready to allow the precious grace of God to appear to others who may be in a state when grace appeared in your life.